Welcome back everyone and welcome to the transition mechanisms. Now what you see here obviously you can tell by the IP addressing scheme that yes we personally submitted this in IPv6 mm -hmm. and we use our own little scheme not somebody else's scheme that they just decided to put on the board and just tell you what to do. No, 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 no. We did our own IPv6 scheme and what we're doing is and I'll show you shortly when I open up a router and we're running two, two routing protocols at the same time. That's what's cool because we have three different transition mechanisms. Dual stack, 64 tunneling, and NAT PT. Okay? But, and uh, we're going to talk about pretty much all three of these in this one video. There's no need to do separate videos for each one or anything like that. Because really for the examination, they're not going to ask you all these different types of things. But one of the ones that I like the most is the dual stack. The dual stack. All right, let me go ahead and let's say let's open up this router right here. Hey, look, it worked the first time around. Isn't that lovely? Let me maximize that. So let me get on this side. So you can see. Cool. And I'm going to go ahead and open up. Username. LDS, password, Cisco. All right. And that wasn't it. LDS, password, Cisco. All right, so this is very easy. Instead of going around the whole password reset thing, I've learned a trick that actually one of my students uh, from Ohio showed me. Just go here, click on the interface, go back. Aha, we bypassed it inside the router. Cool. Can't do it with the real router, we can do it with this. So I'm in there. I'm not going to change any passwords since I know how to get around it anyway. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to do a show start to show you. Now, remember when you are routing in IPv6, one of the first things that you need to type is IPv6 unicast routing. You must type that or else you're not going to be able to route in IPv6. So that's one of the things you need to do. All right, and then there's other things in here that we've done. Uh, like we have host tables, DNS servers, things like that. Don't pay attention to that. Okay, uh, but here, look at this. We have an IP version four address. All right, subnetted, obviously, and we have an IP version six address. And you can tell already that in the IPv6, we're running EIGRP 300, and those are just great. That is what's great about uh, IPv6. You can just, since you configure on the interface, all I really have to do is go into the interface, IPv6, EHRP 300, boom, and it does the configuration in uh, global config. It actually puts it in global config. The only thing I would need to do is then go back in global config and maybe put the router ID and do the no shot. Because that is, that is one of the things that is required when you're configuring uh, EHRP for IPv6, you need to have a router ID which is an instance for that protocol and you do need to have and you do need to turn on the protocol. Other than that, everything is done. That's it. This is how you enable that interface to use uh, EIGRP. So very simple. So we know already that we're using EIGRP just by looking at the interface. And we go down, keep going down. There's your clock rates, there are other interfaces, and we're also running RIP. And that's kind of, you know, Hey, wait a minute, but if you, isn't EIGRP the, uh, the um, administrative distance 90? Of course. So you would think, well, wait a minute, isn't EIGRP then going to take over the routing table? Well, of course not. It would if it was IPv4, but since we're running an IPv6 EIGRP, it creates its own routing table. And IPv4 creates its own routing table. Let's check that out. How do we look at the routing table? What's the command? Exactly. Show IP route. All right. And we see that we're getting, and I'm going to put it higher just in case you can't see it. You see we're getting things from RIP. We're learning about the 32 network from RIP, and we're learning about the 96 network from RIP. They're both one hop away. So RIP is working on the, uh, on the network. Okay. So it's the 96, so they're the... Uh, the IP address, I'm on router 2, should be, let's say, 
that will be the LAN. It should be 97 for the actual PC, I believe. That's normally my scheme. You should know your scheme for your... Yeah, I shouldn't be talking. That doesn't ping, huh? Oh, it did ping. Cool. All right, we just saw it before. We got that art. So you see I'm pinging to the 97. To, that's the actual IP address of the PC. The default gateway, I use the last available. So if we increment by 32, that's 120. So it will be 126. The gateway will be 126. There you go. So I can ping the gateway as well. And that's how you should be doing IP addressing just like that. Somebody gives you a network ID, you look at the mask, you should know already what the Nest Network is. Two less, you know, that's the last available. One less as the broadcast. Boom, 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 boom. That quick. Anyway. Uh, so with dual stacking, you see that you have IPv4 that's actually working on your network. And if you do a show IPv6 route, you take a look at the actual IPv6 routing table. And now you see these. I'm learning about the 2001 3200 CAD 1000. I'm also learning about the 1200. Uh, is there anything else? No, I think that's it. Only those two. Okay, so you are, both routing protocols are working. And I'm able to get across from one side to the next using them. So think about the, just the redundancy of it. If your computers, both every computer nowadays has IPv6 enabled. I mean, you can ping in your, like this is my laptop here, and I am attached to a network, I believe. And well, I'm gonna ping just a loopback, right? I can ping, ping, uh, let's say loopback, and I'll put a switch, um, uh, minus six, I believe that's the switch for it, and it gives me the IP version six. If I were to put minus four, I will get the version four. Uh, loopback address using the little switches so you can IP the dual stack uh, transition mechanism is great because you're not always going to walk into a network and you're going to build it from the ground up that would be lovely if you can do that but that's not the the majority of the cases you know walk into an existing network and you're not going to say okay everybody we're going to change everybody's IP addresses everybody stop working uh, or you're going to work at night and then only half of it gets done and you're going to have issues. So with these transition mechanisms, meaning this dual stack, I can configure everything IPv6. Not worry, not disturb the IPv4 network. And then it's a, it's a seamless transition. Boom, boom, boom. Once everything turns IPv6. All right? And you do this normally for your local LAN, for your local LAN, dual stack. But dual stacking is a very, very nice and clean way all right, to do your transition from IPv4 to IPv6 without your users actually, you know, finding out what, you know, what's going on. They, they will be like, hey, I, I kind of skipped the beat, but that's about it. All right. The next transition mechanism, uh, which obviously in the packet tracer we're limited, is called 64 tunneling. And you usually use that when you're going on to the Internet. Because you're going from an I two IPv6 networks, but then it's got to go through these routers. That one router may be IPv6, the other one is IPv4. So it creates these tunnels that will transform or carry the IPv6 on an IPv4 network until it gets to the other side. That will be another transition mechanism that you can use. The last one is NAPPT. Now, don't get confused. We use NAT now to translate from public or from private addresses to public or public to private. What NAPPT does is not that. What NAPPT is actually doing is translating from IPv6 to IPv4 or vice versa. And believe me, even your book says this is not the recommended way of doing it. So if you're using NAT, stick to the IP version 4 of NAT, okay? Do your dual or your 64 tunneling. You'll be better off doing 64 tunneling than you are doing NAPPT, right? Just creating these tunnels where the IPv6 traffic can go on through IPv4. And then eventually NAT will go away. But we need to embrace. Now, there are more transition mechanisms out there. Like Microsoft uses Torito servers that have an actual Torito server out there. 
to translate for IPv6 if you're using NAT. That will be a tra uh, another transition mechanism, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, they also have 64 tunneling, and they also have for internet connectivity, and they also have the um, what is it? The ISATAP, right? The ISATAP, which by default is already working anyway on today's operating systems for the local area network. So there's a lot of different mechanisms that not only Cisco but Microsoft has actually created so we can make a smooth change into the IPv6 world. Because as my shirt says, what does it say? Resistance is futile. We must stop having that resistance to change over to IPv6. They've given us so many ways to make it, you know, easy, in quotations, for us to change over that we need to. Obviously, in a huge enterprise with thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes, this is not going to be an overnight thing or a six-month thing. It may be a three-year or four-year or five-year project that may take that long because we want to make sure we do it correctly and as little loss as possible. But know that these things are in place. Know that we can configure the dual stack, that we can have the 64 tunneling. And you know, not worry about NAPT because it's not recommended anyway. All right, and just use 64 tunneling to go across the internet. So we have these things in place. We need to start embracing them and start using them. Because IPv6 does bring in a lot of features that will help us, all right? Just the fact of no broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, come on. I understand that looking at hex numbers gives you a headache. It gives me a headache too. It's been a while that I've been looking at it, so I'm getting kind of used to it, and just like everything else. But again, these transition mechanisms are on your exam. They don't go into details. At least that's what my students tell me that take the test. They just basically ask you, hey, out of the following, which is the, what are the transition mechanisms? You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Pick, choose two. You know, things like that. They're not going to get into the details. As long as you know that that's what they are, that's what they're looking for. So read up on it. There's not that much there to be, you know, read. If you have the book that I told you, it's just enough for you to know what they are, their concepts, and then you can start implementing them on your network. Obviously, try a uh, practice network first or a simulator before you actually, you know, into a production network. But like I say, for my, my own personal self, what I, what I love to do is dual stack. It is the easiest thing in the world. You don't have to worry about it. You can walk into any IPv4 network and put in IPv6 and you'll be running just fine. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this comes to the end of the transition mechanisms and I shall see you in the next section. Thank you.